Hi, my name is Victoria and I'm a thyroid cancer survivor. We're here today at the 22nd International Thyroid Cancer Survivors Conference in Denver, Colorado. I'm here today with Dr. Johan Lorch. Dr. Lorch, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you very much. We're going to be pleasure. talking about treatment options in radioactive iodine refractory disease. Yeah. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, I work at Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, which is uh, one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard Medical School. Uh, and uh, my field is uh, head and neck cancer, and I'm directing the thyroid center at Dana-Farber. Well, you've traveled a long way to be here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we get into treatment options for RAI refractory disease, can you help us understand what is RAI refractory disease? Yeah, so thyroid cancer, as you know, is common. It's the most common endocrine malignancy uh, out there. And um, thyroid cancer typically has a reputation of being really rather benign. And in, for the most part, this is totally justified. Most people uh, have a thyroid nodule. They get diagnosed with thyroid cancer. They undergo surgery. Maybe uh, they receive some radioactive iodine, which is a, essentially a targeted form of radiation afterwards. And they're fine. The cancer is gone and never comes back. Uh, however, in uh, a number of patients, and it depends on the type, and it can be anywhere between uh, 2 and 10 percent uh, or so chance for the differentiated thyroid cancers, uh, the cancer can actually come back and eventually become what's called iodine refractory, which means that it no longer responds to uh, radioiodine. And uh, that's typically then uh, a stage where um, things get a lot more complicated and where also the prognosis uh, tends to not be as good anymore as it is with normal traditional thyroid cancer. Thank you for that. So do we know why some patients have RAI refractory disease? We have some understanding of it, uh, although still it's, it's, it's not easy to predict who will develop iodine refractory disease uh, when you're just diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer. We know, for example, that if you have a certain mutation, which is called a BRAF, typically V600E mutation, that increases your risk of developing recurrent thyroid cancer and iodine refractory thyroid cancer about two and a half fold. Uh, um, now, considering that generally the prognosis is so good, the increase of the risk of uh, iodine refractory disease, by, uh, uh, the increase two and a half fold is really not that much. You we're still talking about a small risk uh, of developing that and also considering that BRAF mutations occur in actually the majority of cases with um, thyroid cancer. So it's really not very good at predicting whether or not you will develop disease. There is another uh, set of mutations which affect a different gene, which is called the uh, TERT uh, gene. Now, if that's mutated, especially if, it's that mu if that gene is also mutated in conjunction with a BRAF mutation, then there's a very high risk for uh, recurrence and then eventually uh, iodine refractory disease. And then there are also some other subtypes, such, a, such as Herthel cell carcinoma of the thyroid gland that also is typically fairly insensitive to radioactive iodine. Um, and eventually, uh, as you go down the more towards the poorly differentiated and undifferentiated or anaplastic thyroid cancers, uh, then uh, those are almost always iodine refractory. So if I'm a patient and I find out that I, my disease is RAI refractory, what are my treatment options? What happens next for me? Yeah, so uh, the fact that you have iodine refractory disease doesn't necessarily mean that you need treatment right away. And that's actually really one of the uh, most difficult questions in the, you know, when you're uh, having a thyroid cancer patient in front of you does this uh, patient actually need treatment or can we safely wait? And in many cases, in fact, in most cases, the answer really is for the most part, you can actually wait. There are certain things though that, are, that will help to slow down the progression. You may not be able to get rid of your cancer, but you may not need treatment, but in order for that to happen, there are certain things that you should do. One, for example, is you know get plenty of exercise, eat a healthy diet, uh, and try to maintain your general health as much as you can. Uh, other things 
are uh, fully suppressing another hormone, which is called uh, TSH. Uh, stands for thyroid stimulating hormone and it's part of that feedback mechanism that uh, is generally there to uh, regulate the release of hormone from the thyroid gland. Now if you had thyroid cancer and it's refractory most likely you don't have your thyroid gland anymore so this hormone doesn't really serve any function but if you have if you have high levels of this uh, hormone TSH that uh, that can also stimulate the growth of cancer cells. So you want this as low as possible. And the way you do this is by taking a relatively high amount of Synthroid, and you should do that together with your endocrinologist or a uh, primary care doctor, but your TSH level, uh, which is again this hormone level that tells the thyroid gland to work a little bit harder, but also tells the thyroid cancer cells to grow faster, which you definitely don't want. Uh, you know, you want to keep that low by taking Synthroid or, you know, your, your thyroid uh, hormone replacement um, that, that, that you're on. Uh, that, uh, that is, in fact, uh, your, your cancer pill at that moment because mm -hmm. just suppressing TSH uh, usually does a very good job at keeping your disease under control. And the goal is always to get away with as little uh, treatment as possible, and if, you, if that helps you to at least delay the onset of treatment with any of the drugs that we're going to talk about, uh, then that's a good thing. Let's go back to someone who has REI refractory disease, mm -hmm. um, and then and we're watching and we're waiting, and, and then and, and we decide that we do need to move forward with treatment. What other treatment options exist? Are there any, any in development? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, look, about 10 years ago, there was nothing that was FDA approved. Um, and now we have uh, a whole number of uh, treatment options. And I think, and this is just 2019, and with the pace of research and development, uh, you know, I'm sure that 10 years from now, we will have a whole host of new drugs that we don't even know about yet. Um, so right now, as you know, uh, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as serafinib and lenvatinib, uh, are um, uh, FDA approved and uh, are the standard of care. Um, most people prefer lenvatinib over serafinib because of some data, but they've never been compared head to head. They're both uh, viable uh, treatment options. The problem with both of them is that uh, they're both relatively toxic, which means that they're associated with a lot of side effects. There's a lot of usually fatigue, then in some cases hand foot syndrome. Uh, uh, gastrointestinal, you know, GI uh, side effects, uh, which can be very serious and uh, in some cases even uh, be fatal. There's high blood pressure, which is something that can be managed, but is still something that will require a lot of attention. Uh, so, you know, these, these are not easy drugs uh, to take, but we have them and they're, they work, uh, for the most part, they work beautifully um, for some time. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, none of these options that we have right now are curative in any, in any way. Uh, so, w which means eventually uh, the cancer will develop resistance to them and will start to progress. And the question is, of course, you know, what to do then? So, um, a couple of years ago, we had a trial open uh, with a, a drug which is called Erolimus. It's totally different from all the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's an mTOR inhibitor. It's actually derived from a drug called rapamycin, uh, which is um, a derivative, um, uh, which, which is actually found naturally in the soil in the Easter Islands. And uh, we've tested it, and it also works really well. Uh, it works uh, actually very well uh, in uh, normal, you know, quote unquote, normal iodine refractory disease of the papillary and the follicular type. It also works beautifully in a, a type of iodine refractory thyroid cancer, which is called Herthel cell carcinoma, mm -hmm. uh, which is over, which is overall a s relatively small group in thyroid cancer but uh, is clearly overrepresented in, the, uh, in, in iodine refractory thyroid cancer there. It's about a third or so of all cases. Uh, and there I have yet to see a case uh, that does not respond to Everolimus. It, uh, in terms of side effects, it's also totally different from all the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's not, it doesn't really cause hypertension, 
Uh, but on the other hand, it, ca it causes a certain level of immune suppression, which uh, goes along with uh, a risk for especially upper respiratory infections and uh, things that typically can be managed with antibiotics. But you know, there are there are side effects uh, clearly uh, associated with everything that we do. For cases that are iodine refractory uh, and are have progressed beyond a level where it's clear that you should start treatment, um, the more specific BRAF inhibitors. Uh, are out there, also approved for a variety of uh, cancers and can be obtained. I think, uh, you know, they haven't been studied extensively, but uh, some of the data that emerged recently show that um, that the response rates are quite reasonable. There was there's frequent shrinkage, and in an additional number of cases, there's then what's called disease stability, which means that the cancer stops growing, uh, which is you know which for the most part is good enough. Mm. Uh, and uh, in terms of side effects, so uh, you know again the balance between risk and benefit, in terms of side effects, um, those are generally a little easier to take than the multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as lenvatinib and serafinib. Uh, and also probably um, a little bit easier to take, and for most patients, easier to take um, than um, Everolimus, uh, the other drug. But what I'm hearing as a patient overall is that there are options, um, there's a lot of hope for us, and there's that, yes. that, that you and others are doing a lot of research to evolve the treatment options for RAI refractory disease, and that's very promising. And I, and I speak for myself, but I'm sure I speak for a lot of other patients when I say we are so grateful that, that you and others like you are, are doing this research um, for, for cancer generally and specifically for RAI refractory yeah. thyroid cancer. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.